Okay, cool. So why do we do RNA sequencing? Um, so one of the I guess, fundamental questions that we want to see in biology is just how cells, cells differ across different conditions, across different tissues, across different um, kinds of exposures. Um, and sort of the main uh, difference here are the sort of biological processes that manifest in differences in cells. So the sort of uh, picture that, that we've pulled here um, basically shows this really complex um, cellular process on the right hand side, which leads to differences in in uh, cells and within sort of the um, heart within a within a mature adult heart. So we have these questions of what exactly are the genetic base bases of these functional differences between cells. So what makes it what, what makes connective tissue different from muscle tissue or or epithelial tissue? Um, we know from genetics that all these cells have the same DNA, so have same germline genetics, um, and sort of what we what makes these differences in cellular function um, are different different abundances of proteins. Um, for now, at least, large sample sizes, uh, getting high throughput protein abundances are, it's still technically difficult to, to estimate protein abundances. I don't know how much, for how much longer that's going to be true, uh, but, um, but compared to, still compared to, compared to measuring protein, sequencing RNA is, is still more practical. It can be done at much higher, uh, much high, higher throughput. Uh, there's also other sort of reasons to study RNA as well. Um, RNAs have other functions aside from just translating into proteins. They can be regulatory for other for transcription of, of, of other RNAs, and this can sort of this will sort of build out a basis for these different pathways that are these regulatory pathways that are important on fundamental consequences on, on proteins. Um, so. Thinking about transcriptomics, thinking about RNA is um, sort of a subset of this larger branch of computational biology or biology in general, these functional genomics um, analyses. Uh, we can think of lots of different kinds of molecular phenotypes like uh, epigenetics, uh, methylation changes. We can think about other kinds of epigenomic annotations, enhancer uh, uh, re re regulatory machinery, chromatin assays. Um, Transcriptomics is one of these um, functional genomics panels, but we will think more broadly. Today, uh, for this week, we'll think mainly about gene expression. But there's, again, more, more broad spectrum um, concepts in, in, in transcriptomics. There's alternative splicing, how do different exons um, splice uh, together? Where are those splice sites? Um, alternative isoform expression, genes have different kinds, different transcripts that, that sort of bundled together. How do we measure that? Um, as well as, um, as well as different kinds of RNA sequencing technology as well. And there's proteins, and metabol metabol metabolomics, other kinds of things that, that aggregate together. Yes. The question back on proteomics, is it limited by charging sample size? Um, it's more so the quantif. I actually like. I, I'm, the more I think about it, it's more so. Um, I think the technology is just not as cost efficient as uh, for the high level of high throughput um, that RNA sequencing gets you. Like I said, I'm not sure how much longer that's going to be true. Um, but there's also. And uh, the, when we think about it, trans, RNA transcripts aren't, aren't really a good proxy. Are great. In some cases, they are a good proxy for the protein that they code for. Um, but in most cases, it's not a really a good one-to-one -one comparison. So I think transcriptomics is starting to become less of the end goal or less of a sort of this is the main um, omic that we study, and more so a, a complement to all of these other other kinds of multi-omic um, uh, profiles that we, we can study. 
Um, but I do think there's a lot of wealth of information in RNA because of the regular because of these like un unprocessed transcripts that that we still haven't been able to uh, tie back to um, tie back to a gene family or a function. There's also these regulatory functions that that, that I talked about, um, and there's also um, I think the other important thing to think about uh, as sort of a backbone for um, studying complex traits is that is the central dogma. So genetics helps us study DNA, but we have to, we have to, we have to think, we can't just jump straight to um, proteins because there's something that's mediating that um, genetics to uh, protein uh, translation, I guess. Um, so what kinds of things can we study if we uh, look at transcriptomics? Um, we can think about how or why there's a map between genotypes and phenotypes. So how does um, genetics affect these complex traits? One way of doing that is to think about the sort of mediation there, what genes are being affected by these genetics and how do those translate into proteins? Um, there's also a sort of um, different kind of uh, question as well uh, of, are we sure that we're seeing all of the transcriptome that we need to? For read RNA sequencing, the type of data that we'll deal with only recovers about 20 to 50 percent of, of, of a transcriptome. And trans these transcriptomes, unlike a genome, differ across cells and across tissues. So, it's, so RNA sequencing actually gives us um, a tool to discover and annotate all the different transcripts of, uh, of a given gene. Um, there's also, we can think about differences across tissues, across cells for gene expression. See how genes work together in different pathways and different networks, and then also um, some practical, more practical um, applications of how uh, gene expression varies across different uh, exposures and different environmental um, uh, factors. And then, can this be used as medical diagnostics? And there's actually pretty great uh, RNA actually can be a pretty good tool to help us. Um, diagnose different kinds of uh, diseases. Breast cancer is one, one of these really great um, uh, success stories here where you can actually subtype uh, breast cancers based on uh, tumor, trans tumor transcriptomics. And it's, and it's a pretty good way of um, diagnosis and prognosis therapy. Um, so it's also this a pretty short example here. This is one of the papers that, that you'll have available to you to, to, to read for the homework. Um, but essentially, it's a uh, mouse transcriptomic analysis that looks at gene regulatory networks in um, rods and cones of, of, of mice. Um, so another sort of what, how, what like application of transcriptomics and RNA seq in um, in in something that's a little bit in a very complex tissue and, and tissue system that actually pulls out a very interesting biology here. Any questions about RNA seq in general? The sort of thirty thousand foot uh, view here. Okay, so that actually um, brings us to yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, so this, um, as far as I remember from this paper, is um, those, uh, yeah, I, that's a thing. You can read the paper. It's, um, but as far as I remember, it's just, Showing sort of the showing the broad scale, like within the first two PCs, you can like um, pull apart like the full transcriptome is like shows these wide widespread changes in widespread change changes that like that show deviation in the first two principal components. So between the wild types and this this knockout of, of whatever transcription factor that they were interested in, uh, and you, and like it. Same thing here. You can like see these like 
sort of pathway changes here uh, across the different modules here. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I think we can uh, talk a little bit about the uh, protocol for um, RNA-seq. Um, so RNA-seq, you can run this on a bulk tissue, a whole, a whole tissue sample, um, single cells. There's a workshop for single cell RNA sequencing. We're not gonna be um, dealing with that kind of data here. Um, you can also culture cells and think about cell type specific. Uh, RNA sequencing um, or just single nuclei. Whatever, aside from single cell, which the, te the technology is a little bit different, most of this is very simple. Uh, bulk RNA sequencing is, is a, sort of follows the same sort of process. You have a sample of cells here, and you you slice those cells and extra extract the total RNA from that um, from here from whatever sample you have. And from there, uh, the mixture of RNA that you have is um, these protein coding uh, RNAs, different kinds of non-coding RNAs, long and small um, RNAs that sort of end in poly A tails, polydenylated tails. Um, and the sort of one of the choices to make in a protocol is to select for um, what RNAs you want to enrich your analysis for. So there's different kinds of um, di different kinds of ways to think about this. You can select for only the RNAs that are polyadenylated. Um, so that, that that selection here only gives you these blue polyadenylated uh, RNA fragments. Um, you can think of ribo ribodepletion, which uh, is sort of another a size. Um, uh, another sort of uh, size related um, uh, selection, but also things by function as well, where these are mostly uh, RNAs that code as well as long, long, um, long, long nucleated, um, um, nucleated RNAs. Um, and then you can also do a short size selection here as well uh, and select only small RNAs, um, which tend to be these non-coding RNAs that have more regulatory functions. Either way, depending on the different kind of selection um, that you run on, on your total uh, RNA sample, the process is very similar. Um, you, but essentially the, the, the first goal here is to convert the RNA back into a cDNA library. We have a workshop on library prep um, as well. So if you're interested in this sort of leg of the um, protocol here, uh, we have a workshop for that. Um, what this does is give us a library of DNA uh, because through reverse transcription, we can generate this uh, DNA library, which you can then chop up and then feed into our PCR amplification and sequencing machine. There's lots of different parameters to select for during a sequencing experience as well. Uh, the first and I think most important is read length. For, for short reads, um, this usually um, is around 50 to 200 as the 200, 250 as the um, biggest you can get. Um, uh, and what this essentially does is the shorter the reads, the faster uh, your sequencing uh, runs and the more reads that you can run. That's called, so that's the other sort of selection here. How many reads do you want to generate per sample? So that's sort of the cost benefit analysis there. So if you have longer reads, you tend, tend to have, you tend to run less reads per sample. Um, but altogether, reads times the number or the read length times the number of reads gives you sort of the coverage that, that you have. Coverage meaning how many times do you, if you line up all of the sequencing reads that you have, how many times you cover the transcript now. Um, on the flip side, as you can think, um, sort of what, what, what might be obvious here is that if you have short reads, most genes are way bigger than 250 base pairs. So if you if, if at most for short reads, you have 250 base pairs, you're not gonna be able to cover the entire gene body. So that's why more recent technology um, 
has been they've been trying to optimize uh, sequencing for long reads. So instead of 250 base pairs, these are around 10,000 base pairs or more, 20,000 base pairs, so, and, and this can actually cover large chunks to the whole uh, large chunks of the gene to, to the whole gene body itself. And this helps us, um, uh, and this helps us cover all of the transcriptomic changes uh, within uh, a single gene. So, uh, Arjun. Yes. May I ask some questions? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm curious, is there any way to select, uh, before the DNA synthesis, can we select specific RNA? Or how we isolate unwanted RNAs? Is uh, it uh, before the all of this analysis or after cDNA synthesis and some reading process? Yeah, so it depends on what you mean by unwanted RNAs. So, if you, so say you're you don't want to include lots of these small RNAs. You can do a ribodepletion um, or a, a poly A, like a poly A tail selection, and with some specific kits, blah, blah, right? Yeah, but if you uh, want to sort of okay. avoid, say, I want to avoid all cytokines. Mm -hmm. or genes that code for cytokines. That's something that I, I, I'm not fully aware if that's possible. Um, yeah. Pre-cDNA library synthesis. There are other kinds of sequencing technology or not sequencing, but other kinds of assays for transcriptomics that can allow that. So um, obviously PCR to target single genes. That's one way of of thinking about quantifying that expression, that expression of a, of a single gene, but you can also target groups of genes that you're interested in through something um, through a targeted um, RNA sequencing panel. So, something that um, people use in a lot of clinical settings is is a a, a, a nanostring chip. So essentially, it's a probe set of hundreds of genes um, instead of tens of thousands of genes that are actually in the transcriptome. And if you're, say, you're interested in, say, only immune genes, you can you can select a probe set that has 300 immune-related genes and assay only the expression of that. So it's a little bit like a microarray, but also a little bit like RNA sequencing, and it brings with it different kinds of sort of data problems as well. So that's, that's, yeah, thank you. So, um, what, so long, like throughout the, there's going to be lots of choices to make for analyzing RNA sequencing. Um, and, and, but and all these choices hinge on what your eventual goal is. So, um, and that sort of choice also is important when you're running your experiment. So, say you have hundreds of samples. And you're interested in in seeing what the gene expression differences are between cases and controls of whatever disease you're interested in. That's where you probably want to run short read RNA sequencing because you're more interested in protein coding genes that have been well annotated, and you want to uh, rapidly quantify your hundreds of samples to broadly look at these gene expression changes. But say you're interested in uh, some you have eight brains from postmortem schizophrenia patients. Um, and if you're interested in things like alternative splicing, different alternative transcripts, and you want to annotate genes and that may or may not be sort of driving genetic effects on, on this complex trait, that's where you want to think about long read of sequencing, where you're, you're no longer thinking about gene expression and its changes across different uh, variables. You're interested in, are we actually measuring the right thing? Are, are we sure that the annotations that we're using for different genes are the only annotations that matter? That's sort of the, so that, that that's where you want to be able to sequence the entire gene body rather than just bits and pieces and, and do that sort of puzzle um, to, to put it back together. And we'll talk about, um, this a lot more when we when we uh, start thinking about 
alignment and um, you know, all that. Any more questions here? Great. Um, so, uh, okay. So we'll start with, uh, we'll start right now with, um, what we'll be, so what we'll talk about now is uh, sort of the raw data that you get from an RNA-seq um, experiment. So what we essentially get from raw data is um, a series of reads. A read is just like, like I mentioned, since we cut up the cDNA into different fragments, a read is just the RNA sequence for that small fragment. And for every, every sample, you have thousands to millions, um, hundreds of thousands to millions of reads. And each read is just a sequence of base pairs. So there's a video here that you can take a look at from Illumina. Um, but the, essentially, the way that this is run is a lot like um, multiple massively parallel, parallelized Sanger sequencing. So you're basically building up the building up each um, uh, sequence by basically iter iter iteratively looking at which base pair sort of lines up properly. And, and every single time a single a fragment gets a base pair that's matched matched properly, there's a diode that lights up with a different color for each uh, base pair that's added. And that's sort of um, just registered by, by, by the sequencing machine. So this is very similar to Sanger sequencing, which um, um, basically does the same exact thing. It, it's, 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 it's a much smaller throughput, um, but it gives you these sort of, Sanger sequencing gives you this squiggly, these squiggly lines here that sort of give you the intensity of each each light emitting diode, there's like microfluidics that's been put into RNA sequencing, um, and they're able to terminate each uh, Sanger sequencing, but, but automatically, which makes it massively high high throughput. And the sort of video here that it's a little bit hard to show over Zoom is uh, does a really good job of illustrating um, this whole process. Yeah. Any more questions? Any more details that you'd like to know? Um, one thing to always is note is that the cDNA libraries is, is it isn't the, it, it doesn't have the same number of millions of reads that your RNA library or your RNA sort of uh, raw data does. Um, there's a amplification step, so you do your reverse transcription, get your cDNA library that's pre-selected for the different RNAs you want to um, sequence, and then from there, the first step in any RNA sequencing machine is uh, a PCR application. So it sort of makes these, um, it basically takes reads that are very similar to one another, sorts them out in, into different pockets and runs these like application steps that generate these like forests of similar fragments. And that gives you relative abundancies. And that's why um, the relative abundancies and makes it much more easier to um, build up the sequences. Um, so since Illumina RNA sequencing, um, has this really high throughput, uh, typically you're going for around 10 million reads per sample. And if we're thinking about sort of a average read length of a hundred base pairs per sample, um, that's going to be, um, a lot of data. <laughs> that's that's a lot of data. So this um, so these raw data files come in as something that's called a fastq file, and the sort of ma the mouse data that 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 I showed from the Kim et al. paper, I think it's like twelve or sixteen samples, and the entire data for that it's publicly available is fifty three gigabytes. So it's it's it's, it's a massive amount of data. Just because of just how um, just how much encoding or how much sort of data is encoded in 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 the RNA here. So fastq files are um, actually let's take a ten minute break now and then we'll dive into talking about the file formats and then um, we'll 
take a look at at the files themselves um, based on based on what I provided with the sample data and looking at that on on Hoffman. So let's take a break. Let's try to come back in yeah in ten minutes, so twenty two twenty five, and we'll start back up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like, I think uh, so. The way that there's a lot of like costs benefit here, right? So if you have, if you have lots of samples, so it's, it's sort of like where. So when you're designing a, an experiment like this, um, there's the money that you have. So and so like you fix, say you say you say you you have a fixed sample size, right? Yeah. That's where you have to think about how many uh, do I want to sequ sequence all the samples and maximize read length or coverage here, or do we maximize coverage and sequence? A certain amount. There's a trade off here, and it's not a linear trade off. So, there's some papers um, for different, like for, for like differential expression analysis. There's some, there's papers that sort of do that uh, cost benefit analysis for you. If you're interested in things like, like what I'm, what I do, like linking genetics to expression, there's another sort of like sort of cost function there that, that, that you can think of. Think of. Um, the other sort of issue is the other sort of um, question is uh, let's say you fix a, to like if you fix your money sample size versus coverage or uh, like all these these three parameters are like all, all that matters ten million I think for differential expression analysis is sort of where you want to be shooting to get maximum power or to get sufficient power um, but when when you're thinking about like annotations of new transcripts for long reads you're going to have to go for like 60 million 70 million 100 million reads uh, for sample so it, it's really it, it's dependent again money sample size and what exactly you want to do with your RNA sample I guess I follow up by um, so like Yeah, so I mean that that so the more reads you have, the more accurate you can be about. So what what we're trying to like if you, if you think about statistically what we're trying to do is we're trying to represent the sort of full variation that we see across whatever generalizable population you think about. So for you it's like these sort of coexisting sort of I don't know, like colonies of bacteria and algae, right? Mm -hmm. So it's sort of it, like for you, it would be good to think about like, is, is it um, like what kind of analysis are you interested in? So if you're thinking about, it's so like, I mean, the, the naive answer is sequence as much as you can, like, mm -hmm. As as high your as your sample size you can be, and but try to maximize um, sort of. So, like you, since you're doing these cultures, sample size may not be as important as read depth because you're more interested in these like very rare transcripts, maybe. Um, so, like that would be my sort of. Um, but I mean, it, it's again, it's you're gonna have to think about the budget that you have available. Absolutely. Um, and the different kinds of like conditions that you have as well. And, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, 2015. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like I did my I finished my PhD in 2020, so um, yeah. Quick question on the pipeline of constructing samples. The collection of RNA types, that's usually something that you would buy a kit for that's designed to do that. Yeah. If not 10, then it's not. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I think most, yeah, the for Lumen at least, the like small RNA. Um, just gives you better ways of like um, probing the small RNAs so that that it, it's more amplified than um, than than the other sort of. I don't know, like, they call them like contaminant RNAs, even though they're they're real um, real stuff there. Yeah. yeah. Okay.
Okay, we can sort of get back um, slowly into it. So let's switch over to these exercises, this exercise HTML. So if you just click on that, uh, you'll pull up this HTML document that um, has some sort of instructions to walk you through um, working with the real data and then running some of the software that we'll eventually do. So does everyone have access to Hoffman? Um, has everyone been able to like logged into Hoffman and sort of interfaced with it before? Yes, everyone on Zoom as well? Take that as a yes. Um, so, so, Everything we do, do right now, it's going to be on Hopkin. So I'm going to um, I'm going to open up a Hopkin two shelf, um, and uh, okay. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to try to um, just so that we're all on the same page. We're going to try to make sure that all of our file systems and everything are as close to uh, uniform across everyone in the class, um, so that we don't get lost. Okay. So for those of you on Zoom. Um, let me know if you can sort of see the board here. Um, but there's a slash you. Okay, so when you log into Hoffman, come into your sort of home directory, right? It's slash you, slash home, slash your first letter of your username, slash your username, okay? So we're gonna call that our home directory, okay? And um, one thing to always note is that um, sort of the, how a file structure works in, in Unix is that there's a root, which starts with a, with a, with a forward slash, and for us, it's you, okay? So that's sort of where the file structure starts from. But we're generally going to be in sort of this home directory as our as our home, uh, our, as home base, our file structure, okay? So what we'll do first is um, make a directory in this home. And let's call it tcb-w5a, okay? And we can change our directory into that QCB directory. And if we print the contest contents or list the contents uh, of that directory, we see that it's completely empty. Okay. So what have we done? We've in our in directory that's right here, we generated a QCB dash W5A directory. Okay. So now we're going to make a, a few more subdirectories here. So we're going to make a, a data directory. We're going to make a software directory. And we're going to make a reference directory. And if I list the contents again, what you see now is that there's three things, three subdirectories in there. And we know that they're folders or directories because they're in blue. Okay. Everyone sort of following along? All right. And from here, we have data.
software. So the, the biggest sort of um, error or thing that trips up people uh, when they're starting out with running things on command line is that they forget where they are in the file structure in the file structure and where their their sort of objects are and where they're pointing to it okay so 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 this is sort of the file structure that we're going to be living in we're going to be putting data in the data sub subdirectory we're going to be putting software that we're going to be downloading in the software directory and the reference sort of genomes and transcriptomes and other kinds of data sets in this reference subdirectory. But it's always good, it's always extremely important to know where you are in relation to all this so that when you start running different software or pointing to different files, um, you're actually pointing to the right places. So does all that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna start, so the first bit of this um, uh, exercise worksheet here um, deals with installing and downloading and installing different software that we're going to be using. So right here, uh, first thing we'll download is this fast QC um, software. So if you just copy this here, this is uh, downloading this zip file from this URL. And it's asking to bypass some security um, sort of um, certificate checks. Uh, this is uh, from, from the GitHub, it was in the exercises tab. So make sure you have it downloaded on your on your computer so it opens up rendered instead of just the HTML. Yeah. The way to get out of root while you're in it while you're on the plugin. Get out of a root. So like I can you can see me into root on the cluster yeah. that I can't get out. Um I have to redo the input. Um I I just had a remake, but like when you're like for instance, like instead of your right, yeah, I've already done it. So it's nice to do. Here, so now I'm in root where it's only. Oh, you're in your Silva. If I I can't leave here. Yeah, just see. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Right, I'll just make yeah. A couple of things. I think that that's super hard enough. So, regardless of where you are on the file structure, um. If you just type in CD and enter with nothing after all, you'll go back to your home directory. So you'll go back to home base in red. Now let's say you can go back. Let's say now we're here and go back one by doing CD dot dot. And, and also regardless of where you are, you can print your working directory with PWT. So now we know we're back in home base. Okay. All right. So now, so does everyone have the zip file downloaded? But just a quick question. I I I, I typed in, but it said double get a command not found. I don't know why. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, do you mind sharing your screen? You mind sharing your screen? 
I can't share my screen. I think it's blocked. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, can you now? Oh, yeah, I can now. Let me see. Yeah, see, can you see? I mean, I, oops. Oh, you're not in Hoffman. Yeah. I'm not in Hoffman right now. I thought I locked in, or maybe I locked out already. Oh, you're right. I'm right. That would yeah, be you're, good. You're still on your on your on your Mac. So sorry. I have to, right. I have to redo it. Okay, right. thanks. Sorry for that. <laughs> So you have to remake the same file structures and everything. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So I'm going to unzip this. And now what you see in um, this software folder that we generated, there's a blue folder called fastqc. And we saw our, our zipped directory. Just to catch you, we're just following the exercises um, core sheet right now. Um, and I'm going to remove this zip folder just to make sure that, that we're all um, neat and tidy. So now I'm going to, well, if we take a look at what's inside this fast QC folder, um, there's a lot of um, different kinds of folders here, um, but most importantly, there's this uh, object here called fastqc that's black. So it's right now it's still sort of like a text file uh, format. That needs to be an execute. So that's what the next chunk of code here does. It we can use chmod seven five five. And what that does is converts that fastqc object into an executable. So now that's the quote unquote software fastqc. So now, so what I now did is cd back into our qcpw5a uh, folder and to see if everything. Uh, installed properly, I can navigate from where I am into, into, oh, sorry. So right now I'm in, in QCB W5A, so I can now navigate um, Yes. So that was sort of the, <laughs> the point I was trying to make. Yeah, exactly. So now that I'm here in the QCB folder, I can navigate all the way down to FastQC through software slash FastQC slash FastQC. And if I ask for the help, it's going to give us the help documentation for FastQC. So can everyone sort of call FastQC? Do you have a question? Yeah, so when I moved to the software folder, it basically have help, but then like maybe it's easier to find it from the software. Did you, um, did you go all the way down the, uh, yeah, so you have to go software. Wow, well, when I go to software, it does like- No, 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 so like for this, and you have to software slash. Oh. Yeah. What should we see in that? It should basically tell you the different options that are available in this in, in the software. So most of these command line software, um, if you uh, type out the software name, space. Slash, um, dash dash help or dash h it's going to give you this sort of synopsis and description where uh, this gives you sort of the usage of uh, of the software a description and different kinds of options of the program um, so that's basically a good way of seeing it if, it, if the executable is actually is executable
So there's supposed to be a lowercase uh, uh, it's an executable. It's down. So this is the home folder, right? Yeah. Home folder. Yeah. So they don't yeah. download it. Yeah. When, when I downloaded Vasquez, yeah. I was in here. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so these are all subdirectories, right? Yeah. So this is so when I downloaded Vasquez. I was all the way inside the software subdirectory. Right, exactly. the software download. Yes. So again, um, you don't necessarily have to follow this sort of directory structure, um, but what this does is help you sort of keep track of where everything is that's relevant to what we're running in in this workshop. But I, the, the, sort, the sort of like guiding principle is know where you are, know where you're going. And that, that, that's, that's sort of going to, um, every single time you run a command and you get, if you get an error, those are the two questions you should ask yourself. Where, where, where am I? And where are the sort of, where's the software that I need to call and where, where are the files that I need to um, ask for? Okay, so. I'm gonna go back into my software folder now again. So I'm in, this is my home directory here. This is the QCB 5A, W5A um, sort of base directory. And this is and now I'm in my software subdirectory. And I'm gonna do the same thing and download uh, another, um, Another software called Trimomatic. Same double get folder, different uh, URL. I'm going to unzip that. And remove the um, zip file. Okay. And if you see, What's inside the Chromatic folder here, right? Chromatic dash 0.39. It's a folder called adapters. There's, there's a license in there. And there's another file that's a dot jar file. So that's uh, JavaScript, um, sort of, that's a script. So in order to run Chromatic, you're going to be, you're going to have to uh, sort of invoke it through a, a Java executable. So the next chunk of code here sort of helps you do that. Um, whenever we're running anything even moderately intensive in, in terms of computation, the, the proper uh, sort of etiquette on a high performance cluster like Hoffman is to call for a, a compute node, an interactive compute node. Here it's, um, so this is sort of the, line that you can write here, QRSH is, is asking for a compute node that's uh, interactive. This H here, H underscore RT is the amount of time that you need it for up to five hours. So here we're asking for 30 minutes. Since we only have two hours left in class, I'm gonna ask for two hours. And instead of five gigabytes for now, I'm gonna ask for 10, just to make sure that uh, everything's running properly, or everything's going to, we have enough um, sort of time to run everything. And I'm hoping since I'm running so many jobs, it's going to actually, uh, cool. So now a couple of things that you'll see different here. This right here, this first part um, 
shows that we were in a login node. So this is my Hoffman 2 account. And this is the node that I'm that I'm working on right now. And this is a login node. But once this interactive shell went through, I'm in the N181 1884 node. This is an interactive node. We can run uh, different kinds of computations here up, up to a memory of 10 gigabytes. Any questions? So whenever you log into a into any node, it kicks you back into your home directory. So I'm going to go back into the dramatic folder. And so we're back where we were and we're in an interactive shell. And what we're, what we're going to do next is load up Java. Okay. So the way that any cluster also works is that there are some software and executables that are available pre-installed to all of the users of that, of that cluster. And you can, you can load this up with module load and the name of the software. You can also take a look at what's available using module avail. So just pressing enter through it, lots of different kinds of um, things here like Anaconda that uh, is going to be particularly relevant, Perl, HTS, HTS library, HTS lib is, is also something that's very useful for um, working with these kinds of um, genomics data sets, um, bed tools, Plink, Python, lots of like very common things that uh, you're going to be using over and over again. Okay, right now we're only dealing with um, Java, which we have loaded up and we can, we can sort of call the Java, uh, the jar file here with Java, which says, let's see, this is a, this is a Java executable. It's contained in a jar file, dash jar, and here's the path to the jar file. So again, we're in the Trimmermatic folder, so we don't have to add any sort of preamble to this. Well, let's say we're in the soft, let's say we're in the QCB W5A folder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to probably want to give it more. So just the way to deal with that is still that you know? so um, yeah yeah you're not you're not you're not the you the Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So similarly, right now I'm here, and since I've printed out the working directory, you can see that I'm in this UCB W5A folder. Similarly, now I can follow all the way down to the jar file. So. Starting from here, we go to software, then to so software dramatic and dramatic dot jar, and it runs the same sort of gives you the same help options. Okay. All right, one more software to download. That's going to be, um, oh, crap. 
Damn it. Okay, so there is now a ver- we have gone past version one point five point one for salmon. So instead, let's if if you just copy this first bit, just the releases bit. Um, there's a version one point one one point ten point zero. And you can grab that sort of um, link address from this tar.gz file here. So everyone on this page, Yeah, just the releases. Oh, only four days ago. Wow. Okay. One point one zero. Yeah. So we're not going to be doing so. If I already downloaded the old version. Yeah. So yeah. So that if you double get that, you can you can delete it and re-download it, or just yeah, that might be easiest for now to do that. Does everyone have it downloaded? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so in order to, since this is a tar zipped, a, a tar ball, which is another way of like aggregating files together, and then it's g zipped to compress it even further, you have to use the tar command here, which comes pre installed. Uh, with these um, options here um, to unwrap this um, software. And that gives you a uh, salmon-latest underscore Linux uh, folder here. Oh, that's not it. And then I'm just going to remove the tarball here. Has everyone extracted? Yeah, you, you can. So MV is the move command. Um, and it's always um, from to. Oh, I'm sorry, to from. So move to this from, from here. Um, or alternatively, you can just, it's pretty quick to download, so you can remove and then download again. So again, you can double get commands. <laughs> Always know where you are in your file structure. Uh, and uh, because so you can avoid having to move files later on and things like that. Okay, so what is inside this salmon folder? Um, it's a bin folder, a library folder, a libful folder, and has some sample data here. And if we look at look at the bin folder, it has an it has a green salmon executable. So that's 
what we're going what we're going to be using on Thursday. So you don't have to worry about that for, for, for a while now. Okay, so um, the next um, thing we're going to do now is upload some data to Hoffman. Okay, so this is there's multiple ways to do this. Um, the easiest way is to use a graphical user interface or a GUI for a um, secure file transfer protocol or an SFTP service. So for Macs, which most of you seem to have, um, the best sort of um, software for this, I, I think, is FileZilla. Um, you may have used Cyberduck before, um, but uh, if, so if you have used Cyberduck before, go ahead and use Cyberduck, but you can always download FileZilla from filezilla-project.org. Um, for those of you with Windows, um, I would use WinSCP. Um, so WinSCP. Um, because um, the uh, FileZilla and WinSCP, I think, are the I think best ways to do it. There are command line ways to do SFTP um, um, transfers, um, but I think it'll be easier for us to be on the same page if we use a, a graphical user, a, a GUI for this. So has everyone has everyone used something like this before? Yeah. Um, I think that yeah. No, I think this is. Um, I mean, it. I think usually the best way to transfer like enormous files is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Should we should we download this right now? If you have a Windows, I would download an SCP. If you have a Mac, I would download FileZilla. Uh, we're just talking about what the best way right now is to transfer really big files. So yeah, uh, but that is usually the best way. It's to like encrypt on a hard drive and then to like actually hard hard transfer it. Uh, the other way, I, I don't think it really is that difference in speed for um, like an like a command line S SFTP transfer versus a versus one of these protocols. I think what makes a difference is um, being on campus <laughs> or just being like just the, the main great limiting step is just upload speeds that you have. Yeah. You want to download the file client? Yes. Uh, I would do the client. Yes. So let me know when you have either one of these downloaded, um, because it, uh, using them, using both WinSCP and FileZilla are quite similar. So we we can like talk talk to this when we want to on the same page. Yes, whatever's easiest for you to uh, use and reuse. Okay, so if you open up a FileZilla, same thing with WinSCP, what you'll see is generally four um, options. There's going to be a host, which is going to be Hoffman 2, 
dot uh, UC, IDRE dot UC, UCLA dot edu. You have your username, you have your password. So all that is the exact same as when you're SSH, SSHing into Compton. Report, it's just 22. You can generally save those options um, for, for later. If you quick connect, quick connect, <laughs> there we go. What you'll see is on the left-hand side is a folder on my, right now, this is my desktop in on my Mac, on my personal Mac. And on the right-hand side is the remote side, which is um, linked to my home directory on Hoffman, okay? Versus, uh, the no, 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 it's <laughs> completely fine. Uh, actually, my internet is not give any access to download this. So it's necessary to today workshop. Yeah, uh, yeah, because we're going to be downloading data and okay. Up. Is it different with the mobile X term, right? Um, mobile X term. I mean, so the, there are so. Um, so mobile X term is for your terminal, right? It's, yeah. Uh, Okay. So there is a way to um, so so if you search SFTP terminal Hoffman two this data transfer here mm -hmm. you can. So if you log in to, um, so on your terminal, if you do SFTP, your ID at dtn.hoffman2.idre.ucla.edu, so right here, this connects you to a data transfer node, okay? A DTN, a data transfer node. And what you'll see is SFTP, this, and what you can do is just, um if you're if you put whatever files um whatever files you need in the current lpw your local working directory you can mm -hmm. upload it to the um working directory on hoffman by using the put command here Okay, so what, what we'll be doing is downloading these data sets to the data folder. So, okay. so I'll, I'll do it on, I'll do it on FileZilla first, and then I'll go back and we'll, we'll do it on, on SFTP using Manline, okay? We don't need anything in the port. Port is 22. Port is yeah. Okay. So, is everyone connected to FileZilla or WinSCP? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, what I'm going to do now is so, on the 
on the GitHub, there is a link to a Google Drive folder. I'm going to download all of it together as a file. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time. Essentially, what, what this is doing is downloading these files to my downloads folder. And then what we'll do from FileZilla or from or from WinSCP is just drag and drop. But what you can see on, on FileZilla, or at least on the on the right hand side here, is that we have our where is the QCB? QCBW5A folder. If you look in the software, we have all of our folders that, that we've generated with different software, salmon, traumatic, past QC. What we'll end up doing is we're going to be just taking the data, the past Q files, dragging and dropping them into our data folder. And then the .fa file, dragging and dropping that into a reference folder. Okay. Um, let's see, downloads. The zip file is in the get note location. Did it contain all of those files for this specific Google Drive? Yeah, yeah, because it was too big for, um, yeah, it's too big for GitHub. It doesn't matter. Uh, so I, I just unzipped it in uh, downloads. And what I'll see here is um, so I'm in that unzipped folder that has the sample data, and I have four fastq.gz files in here on the, on the left hand side, and this .fa file. So right now, on the left hand side is where the sample data is. The right hand side, the left hand side is sample data on my current working sort of laptop itself. Right hand side is the folder, the data folder in our QCP W5A. Um, and what I'm just going to do now is just drag and drop and upload, um, upload this, which. Is everyone taking the sound to upload? Mm -hmm. I'm still downloading. Still downloading. Okay, there we go. Now we're trying to. You're supposed to put the wrong time. It shouldn't be instantaneous. It's, it's still 47, like 66 max megabytes mm -hmm. per file. So it sh it shouldn't be it should be pretty quick. Um, for some reason, I've been running into some issues with uh, Valzilla lately. Yeah, they are the Yeah, that might be a little bit. That's a little weird. Yeah. Yeah, this is really this is being a little odd. Yeah. All right. All right. It's like it's uploading, but it's like uploading. It's uploading slower than expected. Is there anything special that you just put? Or something like that? Yeah. 
a way to put it all together to share that. So, I'll tell you the URL. Where are you putting on? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it was probably a transfer work. Huh. This is really odd. Okay, I'm going to call an audible now. And for some reason, this isn't uploading um, properly. Have, has it, has, uh, is it uploaded for you guys? Do you want it like an executable? Like everything's in pre format for me, but I can still be able to put everything there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, these are all text files. So, yeah. For, okay, so. Yeah, my, for some reason, mine's not um, uploading properly. That's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do instead, though, is um, for those of you who are interested in just command lining all of this, we can uh, also do this through. Um, Terminal as well. So now I've connected to a, a, a DTN. Oh, that's not right. Uh, okay. So now instead of doing SSH to Hoffman 2, we do an SFTP to a data transfer node, DTN.Hoffman 2. And what we can do now is the local directory here for me is this base directory slash user slash my username. And what I'm going to do is sort of, this is specific to, to my, only my stuff now. So um, bear with me. Okay. 
Um, So now, sort of done the same exact thing where I've linked my slash user slash Arjun Bhattacharya to my remote working directory, which is the data subdirectory of my QCP W5A. And I can put um, how do you LCD? Oh. Hmm. It's LCD, right? So now I've linked where my sample data is to my on my local machine to the data repository for um, the QCB on Hotspin 2. And I can just transfer these files. Um, one by one. Okay, so does everyone have the fastq.gz files in the data subdirectory? I do. I think I transferred them all yeah. as part of a folder. Yeah, it's always like that. Great. Um, the .fa file that's in there is a reference transcriptome file. So um, I'm going to keep it in, in a reference subdirectory. So once you have it, have these files uploaded, you can move, move them around. Um, so in the data file, so now in the data folder, we're going to have all of our fast gz files. And in our reference is our um, dash whatever dot fa file. Okay. So what is that called? Yeah. And so, okay. So now if we take a look at what, what's in my data folder or fastq.gz files. And if I look at what's in my reference is this GR38 for only for chromosome 18, this, this FASTA file. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break. Now that we have all of our software and files and everything downloaded, um, if you are still having trouble uploading and putting things in the right place, let's move well, We can sort of discuss that during the break, but let's try to reconvene at 3.30 and we'll 
Um, we'll finish up in the next hour. Okay. Yeah, of course.
All right, I guess we can go get back into it. Um, okay, so what we just did was exercise one. Exercise two now is going to sort of deal with these past Q files. Um, so let's go back into um, these slides. Zoom people, you can see the slides. Going to take that as well. Yes. Great. Okay, so FastQ files um, that we downloaded as fastq.gz. Um, they're just text files that have been compressed. Um, so they're plain text files. Um, even if you call them something something dot txt, doesn't change anything. They're usually gzipped because they're enormous. Because if you think about it, ten million reads, um, hundred base pairs per. That's a lot of data that's encrypted there. On top of that, um, each read has four lines. So if you look at this little box here, uh, the first four lines here corresponds to the first read for a given sample. The first line is the ID here, uh, this sort of um, vignette here. Um, it gives lots of dust different properties. If it's a forward or reverse strand, a barcode uh, that give, makes it identifiable. Um, the second line is the sequence itself. So you can see a series of, of base pairs, um, A's, C's, G's, and T's. Sometimes you'll see an N here, which essentially means that, it was, that the sequencer wasn't able to assign a base pair properly. And, and oftentimes those ends are going to be at the beginnings of chromosomes or the beginnings of, of the, like the first few reads have some ends, uh, ends there. The third line is just a spacer. Usually, usually you'll, you'll just see a, a plus sign. And the fourth um, line here is the base pair qualities. So this is sort of uh, assigned by the sequencer that tells you sort of its confidence in assigning a base pair to uh, a base pair for that read position. So these qualities are coded in ASCII format. So um, you take one of these ASCII codings, it's um, letters or numbers converted back to decimal numbers or base 10 numbers. And then if you throw that score into score here, it's going to give you a probability that that base was incorrectly assigned. And then one minus that gives you sort of a confidence score, a confidence rate. Okay. So we're generally looking for confidences of like 99.9 .9 or above. So uh, these scores of 30 or, or above. Um, and those are oftentimes you, like you're not going to be programmatically, you're not going to be like individually looking at these base pair qualities. We have programs or softwares that are going to help us do that uh, quickly. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit of background on what these fast few files look like. Let's try to manipulate a, uh, some of them in, uh, in command line. So <coughs> we see into this data set. And if we look at our exercise sheets, or if we look at our exercise sheet here, um, we have a couple of um, questions here. Um, we're going to be looking at these kd1.fastq. So a little bit of sort of background on what these files are. These are from a some from one of my uh, papers where we ran an RNA seq uh, um, experiment on two knockdown cells, kd1 and kd2, into single uh, two scramble control cells, sc1 and sc2, and um, uh, and so what I've done with these fastq files is just take a really small subset of, of chromosome 18 and, or actually not just chromosome 18, take a really small subset of the first, however many reads um, of, each, of each sample. So the first thing we're going to do is um, basically how many, say, ask how many lines there are in kd1.fastq.gc, okay? So, uh, using Unix commands, how can we sort of extract this information? Any ideas? What's that? Let's try to not unzip it. 
because we, yeah, so we, we don't want to sort of inflate this right now. So if we had, if it was unzipped, how do we print it out into our, how do we spill the content of a file onto our console? So touch could touch sort of touches the file. Cat, um, cat is the way to uh, sort of spill the contents out. So let's try that. So you can press file, so you're not going to be able to cat it. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay, cool. So what we can do is sort of say unzip it first and then cat. And that's the zcat command here. And so if we do that for kd1.fastq.gz, um, let's take a look at the first four lines of it. Okay. So is everyone familiar with the pipe command in Unix? So the pipe command usually is a way to take the output from the, from one command and put it into the next command. So here is a zcat, which if we take a take a really quick look at what the output is, is just printing out the contents of of this uh, file. So now, if we pipe this into a head command, it's going to print out the first four lines. Head meaning header dash n gives us uh, an option for how how many lines we want to print out. That's four. Um, control C. Okay, so let me sort of go to the end. Okay, so okay, okay, so now we have four lines, right? So four lines is one read. As you can see, it's got some barcode information. It has a barcode. It has a, a identifier here, and a barcode. We have a sequence here. Most of the time, we have A, C's, G's, and T's. We have an N here. Uh, we have a spacer. We have a lot of uh, Facebook call. Okay. So the question here now is how many lines does this file have? So we can start with kd1.fastq.gz and then pipe it into another command. So what command is this? Anyone remember lines? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we have six, four, and then five, zero. So 6.4 million lines and how many reads does that correspond to yeah 1.6 okay all right so the next question here is how long is the first read for kd1 okay so this is getting towards what, what's the read what's the um read like for uh for this experiment Okay, so we're gonna try. So let's try to isolate that line, right? The second line. So if we only print out the first two lines with this head command, right? But now we can also sort of print out the last line here for the tail. So now that's printing out the sequence for the first read. And we wanna count up how many characters it has with WC that dash C, okay? That's 76, so we have 76 base pairs here for, for this first read. All right, any sort of questions? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I guess more generally the files like is there any way to like kind of home in on a particular line? Like instead of being like head or you know, like tail or like email or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's awk is gonna be your best awk and said are your two best friends with um uh Unix. Mm -hmm. It takes probably a career to <laughs> sort of master those uh commands, but sac exchange is gonna be your best friend. So, so basically, if you're like, 
like there, there's like really if you want to subset an enormous text file based off of like the third column, you can use awk to help you do that. Uh, sed helps you do things like like pull lines and rewrite them and like loop through lines in in Unix. Um, but it's all this is all stuff that like yeah yeah like the that's why I think we have a advanced Unix course now because we're gonna start teaching awk and, and like. Like at least getting getting people started with Auk and Auk and set and things like that. So do you have a like a location of the text file roughly what is in the main type of word that's sitting so you see the capital C for the above and below section and stuff? Yeah. 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 So there's like um Auk and said gives you good ways to man manipulate the files. You, kind of. <laughs> um yeah. But the but also like these reg these regular expressions, grep and grep l and things like that. That's also going to be a good way of trying to um, find matched strings or, or subset. Um, but again, these are not advanced, but these are like stuff that you'll pick up the more you use Unix yourself. Okay. I guess. Second question. Yeah. Um, these reads so this particular reason, like, um, I don't know if it's weird because like, is there other cases where this even like it would not work if you can just use it for like maybe if it's like I don't know, like it's like the structure. Yeah. Like so, and you can't you can't really mm -hmm. like maybe this read in the case of reading it's like snapped out and you don't want to come to that you better read about it. Yeah. You know, so it won't be working if it's something like. Is this ever a problem? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, this is this is the entire like this is why in like the or like 2010 to 2015 range, people were doing like this this is like a huge problem for Crescent It's like mm -hmm. the concept of a multi-map read. Essentially what you're talking about is is this read belong here in the genome or here in this genome in the genome? How can we tell it apart? And what do we do when they do map in different regions? Um so Sam and Callisto kind of deal with that. Um, uh, we'll talk about what happens when we can't distinguish it tomorrow. Um, and but, they, but this is precisely why long reads are like sort of like cost aside, if we had unlimited money, we should all be running long reads if we do. It's sure there's quantification errors with long reads, but if you can cover an entire gene with a single read, you're, you're, there's going to be much less um, opportunity to have these multi-mapped uh, reads. And that, that solves a lot of problems for you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, just email Eloy and see if you can, like, if you if you want the yeah. recording today, I'll just like, Okay, great. All right. Um, Last sort of question here is what's the Fred scaled confidence score for the first base pair call? So we can sort of look at it manually just really quickly. So the first um, confidence score here is a hashtag. Uh, so if you look at ASCII scores, um, cool, Illumina's ASCII scoring, a hashtag is a 35, um, which um, if we plug into our sort of confidence score, it's like a 99.95%. Um, you're never going to have to do this yourself. Um, you're never, you're never going to have to programmatically go through and see what the scores are, but it's good to know, just manipulate the files and like brush up on some Unix commands. So the way that we do all of this stuff programmatically or, or, or automatically is using fastqc. So uh, what we can do now is going back into my uh, base directory here, I'm gonna call fastqc, and then I'm gonna access Okay. So what this is doing is running quality control assessments for kd1.fastq.g. Okay. So I've called the fastq software. 
the full path from where I started. So I started here, went down my path to software, the pass Q slash pass Q. And then back from here, I, I'm gonna I'm, tell, I'm pointing it to where my data is, which is data slash kd1.fastq.gz. And this dash O here is usually a command for most command line or option for most command line software. The dash O here is telling you telling the software where to output the output files. All right, so now I just back up just a second yeah that's cute yeah 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 or else it's going to print in your working directory and not in the directory not in the data directory Yeah, you can do the same thing. Yeah. Um, I usually do it as like a defining a variable. So say you want to do fast QC, or let's just say fast QC um, software. I um, like just defining variables. So when you're, so like we'll talk about this tomorrow a little bit more and a lot more on, on Thursday. The way when you're starting to write these to go through all of your files, you're gonna have to think about loops or um, job arrays and things like that. And one good way of making sure you're not, you're not having to type things over and over again is defining variables. This is precisely what you're talking about here right now. So right now I can define a variable fastqc underscore software and point it. Point it all the way here. And if I call this, um, I'm gonna do it on kd2 fastq. So I can just call it as a variable now instead of a instead of a sort of path to an executable. So in Unix a variable is always called with a dollar sign in front of it. And you can always put brackets around it to make it make it so that you know it's a variable for, for sure. No, well so that's yeah that, and that's the last thing you can do. You can always pull it to your path. You can put it in either in your bash RC file. Um, but the thing is that I wouldn't put software like FastQC or like you're only you're not going to be using this on a daily basis. Things like R or like if you're going to be using R a lot or Python a lot, those are things you probably load into your 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 um, environment like in your environment. But then also, it might just be better to have different buckets for Python. Like you pull up a Python for your epigenomic analyses, and that's you have a container for that. So, th so that's another thing. That's an, we have another workshop for that. The Docker and other kinds of like container containerizing your your analyses. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at. Um, so every single time we run this fast QC, we generate an HTML. Um, the issue with that is that we can't really pull up an HTML on our terminal, but it we can always pull it back into somewhere on our local machine and um, open up this HTML file there. So just, just as a sort of um, example here, I Pulled, pulled down the kd2 fastqc.html file. And this is what this is sort of the report it generates for every single sample. Any questions? Okay. So, first, we have a um, base stats and uh, tells us um, the file name, 
actually, let me let me pull the fast. Let me pull fast QC one. Maybe I should look at that one. Okay, so as we calculate ourselves, there's 1.6 million sequences here. Um, the sequence length we saw with the first one was 76. 75 is what the average or like the most um, uh, representative sequence length is here. GC can take percent, the percent of uh, Gs and Cs across all the sequences, 52%. So the first sort of bit here gives us the per base sequence quality, this, this FRED score across the positions of the sequences. So each sequence is, has usually 75 base pairs. What you can see is that the base pair qualities are really high, around 40 for the majority of the, of the sequences, um, but there's a little bit of tapering at the, at the start of reads, which sometimes it is, um, that just happens. But if you're in, in the above 28, above 30 range, these are, this is really good one, or really good uh, sequencing, sorry. Uh, don't have to really care about that. Per sequence quality score is sort of the, what's the quality of um, these scores across all of the sequences? So, so what's the mean sequence quality on 40? Or it peaks around, peaks at 40, but we see sort of like inflection point at 38. So really good stuff here. This per base sequence content essentially tracks the GC content or the, the, the percent of each of these uh, sequence um, positions and, and the, the percent of those that are A, C's, G's, and T's. There's, a, there's usually a little bit of wobbling um, at the start and ends of sequences. And that's why a lot of times you'll see a failure or a warning for this um, sort of assessment. Um, but usually if you see a, a pretty inline tracking at, at the end um, or at, within like 10 sequence, 10 base pairs, this is a this is solid, um, nothing to really worry about. Yeah. Next is sort of a distribution of of uh, GC content. Um, so this is another thing that oftentimes um, fails. If you have flash frozen uh, or FFPE, flash frozen paraffin embedded uh, samples, oftentimes that converts a lot, converts a lot of um, Cs to Gs um, in, in your RNA. And um, you'll sort of see that this, this, theoret this uh, sort of actual distribution in red is very different from the theoretical distribution. Um, but here, approximately similar, a little bit of wobble near the peak, but approximately a pretty similar, like pretty normal looking distribution here. Like a peak down here or a peak up here. Yeah, or like, or, or like super like fat tails. Like, yeah. No, theoretical distribution is like just what they've seen across. Like, with it's basically basically a sort of. It's not a it's not a normal distribution, but it's like a thin tailed normal like like you can see like this these tails are really near zero, yeah. and this is like peaks around fifty. That's basically just drew drew a box from there. Yeah. So I didn't know. Like, yeah, yeah. So. No. So this theoretical distribution, I think, is for humans or mice, or so. You're gonna have to use your judgment for this. So, so if you sort of see like a peak, like a peak here. For you, right? That's that's gonna be that's gonna have to be your judgment call there. So, one of the sort of good like, innovations, I guess, of these pseudolami methods or salmon in particular, one of the pseudolami methods is that, at least for humans, they can correct for GC bias. Um, so for, sometimes you'll see like a little bit of squig squiggle here or, or a little bit of like like a fatter tail. Um, 
Sammy can like go back and correct that based on what they what they learned from like other parts of the of the transcriptome. Um, but again, I, I was like I've never really worked with bacterial RNA seq, so uh, that's going to be something you'll you're gonna have to like read other papers and see how they have how they deal with it. Uh, this is how many sort of um, sort of unaligned base pairs that they have, and you can see a little spike at one, but everything else is zero. We're good to go. Sequence length distribution, duplication. This is a, another thing that might be a little bit weird, but but you, but what you see is that there is like there's a peak here of like a, a duplicated sequence of greater than ten base pairs, but less than fifty base pairs. What you end up seeing is that it's just um, an adapter, one of the spiked in adapters for uh, for RNA seq. Okay, so that's basically what you see in, in FastQC. Um, the the general idea for running FastQC is have it done. You can so how do we run this? So say that you have like hundreds of samples of FastQ files somewhere in a folder, and they're all named something dot fastq.gz. You can use an asterisk to quickly go through all of the files that follow this uh, pattern. So since we're in the data folder, it's going to tag all of the fastq.gz files or fastq files, however, however you've saved your data, and it's going to run that in one go. So it's one command, it's going to run, run, run all of them. In general, the way that I sort of think about quality control is you have the metrics saved. Um, you can't really do anything with the metrics right now. You can do a little spot check at first and see if there's like, if like across, if you have like hundreds of samples, you do look at five or six and see if there's like any glaring issues with, with that. Um, but then once you quantify and you look at all the different, and quantify and you like sort of make PC plots and do, you're doing your normalization and you're, you're sort of um, removing other kinds of like variation and things like that. Um, that's when you have these QC done to go back go back to and see if there's any sequencing errors that, that that needs to be fixed. So is it that there is any sequencing errors and there's lots of confounding from from external um, sources, or is it just bad sequencing that you have to rerun? So it's um, it's really hard to sort of interpret just from from these HTMLs. If you have like lots of green green checks and you have a couple of red X's, that's usually not a bad thing. So that's sort of how you like iteratively look at um, doing running quality control. Like it's it's a lot of massaging of data um, that, and it's sort of an iterative process. Is process from quantification down to normalization and then, um, I guess, batch uh, rounding. Yes. Uh, could could you uh, show again, please, the how you find the after analysis the file. The result file. How I uh, can you repeat that? Uh, after completed this uh, reading the fast queue, mm -hmm. uh, where where is the my result file? I cannot find it. So your results are in the same folder as the fast queue .gz file. Ah, so okay. here is this HTML here, and I just pulled it onto my local file and open it up on my on my computer. Okay. okay. All right. Alternatively, um, every single HTML or every, every single run gives you a zip file. So if you like, un if so, if we unzip, not that. If we unzip these kd1 underscore fastqc dot zip, and and I go in here. This actually gives us some of the some of this information in a text file. Let's see what else is in there. But uh, yeah, summary. Okay. So this gives us the overall flags that, that you can sort of collect and also aggregate together programmatically. So you can go through all of these uh, zip folders, say say like, oh look, 
98% of uh, like the flags were passed for all, all of my hundreds of samples here. So we should be fine. Like you see, there was there weren't any like systematic errors with sequencing. That's another way to sort of uh, look that up. And this text file here also includes the sort of statistics, like when the numeric statistics that um, are in that HTML report that you can also aggregate and, and keep somewhere. Either way, um, it's not it's not really a good use of your time to like download each HTML, but you know what now you know where the data is that generates those those reports. Yeah, summary dot txt. Okay. All right. So the last thing we'll do today now is we're going to filter out low quality reads. So what we can eventually do, right, is if we have certain reads for a sample, um, we can either trim them so that there's like bad sequencing at like ends of the reads, you can sort of shorten the read and be like, okay, this, these, the middle 71 base pairs here are what we need. And we can use that to run our alignment. So, th so that's exactly why we downloaded Churomatic. It, it trims reads and if they get trimmed too much, it gets thrown out. And it also sort of makes sure, makes sure that it knows and it's aware of what adapters exist in our data set so that it doesn't trim too much, but just because it's like picking up on an adapter. Um, so this is precisely why we downloaded Churomatic. And this is sort of where I'm gonna turn over to you guys to sort of play around with this, uh, with, with this um, software. Okay, so this chunk of code here gives you a, like a very general shell of what the, the line of code should look like. But you'll see there's some differences, like this right here is version 0 0.35. We downloaded 0 0.39, so you have to make sure that you're um, editing this properly. Uh, the input and output files have to rename properly. Um, and I've also asked for like a couple of like changes to these parameters as well. So this leading and trailing here. Tells you how many, like how many max um, base pairs um, are you looking at at the leading and trailing from from the leading and trailing bases of the of each sequence. What I've given you is three. What I want is twenty. Um, and then the minimum length is set to eighty percent of the read, which in our case is sixty base pairs. So if it trims away more than 15 base pairs, or it trims away so that the sequence is less than 60 base pairs, throw the sequence out, okay? So what you can do um, to also help you out is any good command line software should have very good handbooks or manuals. So I've linked it here. I've linked the handbook here and the manual is available to you right here. And you can sort of sift through this a little bit and see um, what you should be changing here um, to uh, what, you, what you should be changing here. And the other thing you should probably be working on right now is, or working on off of now is some, some sort of scripting software. So this is like, there's a lot of things here, a lot of moving parts I know, but um, so don't try to be working on Word or any, any kind of um, anything that's like specifically available here. If you're on a if you're on a Mac, a note, Notepad is fine to like edit. I like to use something called Sublime Text. Um, yeah, it's a so it's it's a text editing um, software that can sort of recognize what language you're in and help um, 
organize you a little bit better. Um, so choose what what you if you have experience in this. Choose choose what you're what you're comfortable with. If not, you can also open up like an online text editing notebook. But make sure you're make sure that uh, you're scripting in sort of the uh, sort of environment that that is conducive to this. Okay, so. Essentially, what what you should do now is just edit this line of code so that we're so that it's following these um, following these parameter inputs. Okay. Oh, one, one, yeah, yeah. So it's single thread, so you're not like leeching resources for someone else. Yeah, so it's whatever. So make sure it's catered to whatever you've downloaded. Okay. Yep. Yes. So there's two things you're pointing to. You're pointing to the jar file for Termatic. Three things, I guess. Second thing is pointing to the input data. And the third thing is a proper path to where you want to save your output data. Yeah. So, like these sorts of like conventions are like stylistic choices. Like, I've been in labs that make sure that like raw data, intermediate files, and final data are, are in separate folders. Right now, we're dealing with only four four files, so I think it's fine to keep it in in data. I think these. I think it is important to sort of. It's important to make sure that you keep track of what files are where, and there's some some level of linking of files across different process, different processing steps. So. At least for us, where the first processing step we're doing on these files are trimming. So, if I were if I had say five hundred FastQ files, I I would save these trim files separately in, in, in an intermediate folder, and then for the next step, it's another folder. And the last step is in, in, in like a final uh, 
final final sort of online online folder. Yeah. So like so the way so like kd one underscore trimmed dot fastq dot gc is like in the, something like that. So it's still linked by the by the sample name, but it's but you know what what what's what's been done to it. So, so, so where is your, your traumatic file is right here, right? So you can just write up the full path to it. So slash you slash home slash m slash your username slash this slash that slash all the way. So like it's good. it's a really big big sort of sequence of sequence for the path, but it's going to get it. No, no, no. So it's in that test file. Yeah, so that's the file. So the, the assumption always, okay? So for, for I guess, might be more terrible. The assumption for whenever you're calling a file name or like an executable is that you're giving it the full path starting from where you are. So for you, you're starting here. But you have to get here. But there's no way to go from here to here easily. So Either you start here and then point down to contents, or you just say this thing that I want to call the full path starts from a, from a forward slash you home, and then, then you follow the whole like branch down to the traumatic on each other. Okay. All right. You've been able to run it. If I had unzipped file, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so most of this, most of these software work on both the unzipped and zipped versions, um, just so that it's convenient for people. So, did, did, it finish, did it finish running? Um, so yeah, so now you have to go back. Yes. 
Yeah, it's going to it's going to sit up there. Yeah, about 1%, 1.04. Yeah, that's what I have to. Okay, so this is what I had for my code, my white line of code here. Um, so I'm starting in the green box in TCB and Java dash jar. I'm pointing it down to software slash traumatic slash traumatic dot jar keeping the that Fred 33 and but now I'm saying data my data is here data slash kd one gz the output is k uh, is data slash kd one underscore trim shot gz leading is 20 trailing is 20 and the minimum length is 60 and I guess I should put threads one if I run that again so what it, what it does it looks for these adapt uh, these this true seek three adapter it's going to first look where the data is and it's not going to find it um, but then it's going to next look in the same folder as where the jar file is and there's an adapters folder there so it's going to recognize it and that that's when it starts running uh i i'm taking an error it say that could not allocate the meta space Okay, so what you'll have to do is delete the current node that you want. So, oh, there's a qstat u. So, type in qstat dash u and then your your username. Okay. And what you'll see is all of the jobs that you have running right now. I have a bunch, um, but the one that says qr login is this compute node that you generated, okay? Uh, could, could you show me again the code? Okay. But that's your username, not mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of okay. <laughs> and then what you can do is delete the, the specific node that you have running. That's the login node, the, 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 this, that says QR login here. And what you see is now it went from at n184 to at login one. And now I can ask, and now you can ask for another um, login node, another sort of interactive node. And now go for 12 gigs. Okay, 12 G. And then rerun the same. The same line of code that, that that you had, and it should run properly. Everyone here get it to run properly. Get it to run. Mm. Okay. You think the relation to dramatic or dramatic? Yeah. Cool. And one percent of the reads were dropped. For yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So it's going to be a little bit different for everyone just because it's like a the Bayesian method. So it like ramps up and has like different parameters. But if it's if it's around 1%, uh, that thing ran properly. Okay. So Mustafa, this so now what I have uh, now is actually good. it's not solved. It's not what? It's, I, I still take the same error. Uh, do you mind sharing your screen? Yeah, of course. Uh, let me stop sharing. Okay, for everyone else, though, that's all for today. So you guys have to go. We're done. Okay. All right, you're, so you're still on a, on a uh, login note right now. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what you should do now is QRSH. Sorry, what? QRSH. QRSH. H. Spa space. Mm -hmm. Dash L. 
dash, not not slash. <laughs> that oh, okay, dash l space mm -hmm. h underscore r t h r t underscore r t ah uh, like that yes equals no space equals one colon zero zero colon zero zero comma h underscore data all right so you guys equals 12g and now press enter sorry what press enter ah oh. <laughs> um. Okay, so now see the difference. You had login four, you had Mustafa at login four, now you have Mustafa at N1856. Okay. Okay, but actually, I was asking for the this code, but uh, here you see. Yeah, so now you have to now load up Java again. Okay. Yeah, so but the reason you weren't able to run it back then is because you were on the login mode. Can I just, sorry. Oh, no, you, uh, you'll have to, you, no, no, no. You'll have to just, you have to type it out. Module load Java, yeah. And now you'll have to retype the, yeah, presenter, presenter. Now you'll have to retype. So again, now make sure you're in the right um, directories too. Oh, uh, to see. Should I enter the, this sample data? So where is your data? Where is your software? Actually here, here. Okay, so. Uh, software mean the tree thematic mm -hmm. one so it's, it's just here actually i did not create some sub files okay. no, no no it's okay but so now so just since all of this is here start typing out the schematic line here so java uh where is it you're not going to get to you're not going to get to that command command start typing it out okay Okay, so is it work? No, no, no. Press up, go to the last command. Okay, so the issue you're running into now is you're not pointing to the data. So your data is in a different folder, right? It's not yeah, in, I see. So just when you say when you have kd1.fastq.gz, make sure you have QCV sample data, like that that folder in front of it. So go back, go press left. Uh, left. Okay. No, no, no. You, you didn't do it. No, you don't have to CD. You, you don't have to CD. What should I do? So pull up the last command you had. Yes. Now just press the left arrow key until you get to kd1.fastq.gz. Okay. In front of that, that's where you have what, what, what's the folder where you put the, where your data is? Let's see here, right? It's not there. No, no, no. It's in, it's in a different folder. You showed me. So scroll up to the contents. Uh, I'm not sure what should I do. Sorry. No, no, no. Like, uh, okay. So press control C. Okay, now press LS, enter. So your data is in QCB W5A sample data, okay? Yes, here. Wait one second, do you want me, do you, want, do you mind if I take control of your? Mm -hmm. Okay, so.
Okay. So now what you can do is QCB. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Where is the terminal? Oh, it's the Ubuntu one. Yeah. Okay, so it's running now. So do you see the difference of what I did here? I gave it mm -hmm. the folder uh -huh. that it's in. Yeah. And so it, it ran properly. It dropped 8,000 um, sec uh, sequences. And it kept 99.52 and it um, sort of I see. So now and and it generated this KD1 underscore TR question mark question mark ED, but, but <laughs> yeah. you, you can rerun it. You, you can rerun this. Um no, I, I understand so that's wrong. Okay. All okay. right. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah.